So let me now take the time to introduce our, our very endeared speaker, who is a, a, a collaborator and a friend to many of us, long-term um, supporter of our HIV Center here at Columbia, a professor and Dr. Karish Abdul Karim, who is a professor in clinical epidemiology here at Columbia University, also pro vice chancellor for African Health, University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. She's also the Associate Scientific Director of CAPRISA, an organization that many of us know has done really tremendous research um, contributing uh, for, for many, many years. Croatia is also an infectious disease epidemiologist whose seminal contributions spanning over three decades have shaped the global HIV prevention landscape, most notably in prevention technologies for women. She demonstrated that ARVs prevent sexually transmitted HIV that laid the foundation for, for HIV uh, PrEP and has provided insights in Africa and globally on the impact of COVID-19 on HIV and in the evaluation of the COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Karim is, Abdul Karim is the president of the World Academy of Sciences, an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, and fellow of the of the World Academy of Science, Royal Society of South Africa, Academy of Science of South Africa, and the African Academy of Science. Um, I could go on and on. Her research contributions have recognized been recognized nationally and internationally with over 30 special honors, which clearly I don't have the time to list. So we are extremely ple pleased that Dr. Quraysh Abdul Karim was spending the time. Um, with us today, and I now turn the floor over to you, Karisha. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Bob, for that very warm introduction and also for the opportunity to be um, doing the rounds uh, for the HIV Center. Um, I think back, you know, I've either participated and presented for over 30 years, and uh, it's it's wonderful to be back again and to have this opportunity to address you. I also want to thank uh, Theo for his guidance in terms of what I cover. Um, so I think that um, I should get started um, with my presentation. Uh, and um, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is HIV research during a pandemic and experiences and lessons from KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. And uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, the fact that we're still doing this on a virtual platform um, is a sharp reminder that we're not yet done with COVID. And while it's dominated our life in the past three years, uh, we, are, um, uh, we are living in the midst of the pandemic and the pandemic emergency, however, is uh, receding. Uh, notably as death and disease uh, is declining. But I think when we look at the nearly 1,400 deaths that are taking place each um, day, it's a reminder that this is far from over. But I think the other thing is that we're living with the um, SARS-CoV-2 at the same time as we have other epidemics and pandemics, including the HIV um, uh, epidemic. And so I thought what I should do in a start off with is a very quick recap in um, and, and really a global glimpse in terms of where we are with the HIV and then look at some of the challenges uh, that the pandemic has posed and how we um, in South Africa and particularly in KwaZulu Natal um, uh, adapted and have uh, changed our agenda to include COVID and also give with, uh, share with you some insights in terms of the importance of us not stopping the HIV response in our research there, uh, but also continuing with the HIV TB work and how that has actually enhanced our understanding of the pandemic in the midst of multiple simultaneous um, epidemics that were ongoing. So we all know that in 2016, at a high level political meeting, the member states of the United Nations committed to ending AIDS as a public health threat. And that meant uh, by 2030, there will be new, no new HIV infections, no AIDS related deaths and no stigma and discrimination. 
So when we look at the data, the most recent data that we have, we see that we have about 38.4 million people living with HIV and about uh, 29 million who are on antiretroviral treatment, uh, which is quite a remarkable feat, but it also tells us we have a little way to go. And that um, we had about 650,000 deaths. And if we compare that to the UN tar UNAIDS targets uh, set for 2020, um, we fairly close to the 510,000. But I think the real challenge is with the one and a half million new infections, which is about three times the 2020 target. And when we look at these new infections, about 70% remain in sub-Saharan Africa, one in five in South Africa, and two out of three are in adolescent girls and young women. Another way of looking at that is one adolescent a girl and young woman between the age of 15 to 24 is getting infected every two minutes. So most of our response um, for the past uh, seven or eight years has been built on the 90-90-90 paradigm, uh, which is 90% of those living with HIV know their status, of whom 90% are initiated on ARV treatment, and 90% of whom are virally suppressed. And I think what we can see here is that we've made overall good global progress, but uh, it's been um, a little bit uneven uh, in terms of uh, getting to those uh, targets. We have 14 countries across three regions who have achieved that 73% um, uh, target by 2020. And, um, uh, and, and we have some countries where we're really struggling and you can see those as North Africa and the Middle East and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And uh, we've also seen some of the advances that we've made in terms of enhancing lifelong um, adher uh, 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 of enhancing adherence to lifelong therapy through simplified regimens, and then more recently the long-acting monthly dual injectable. So these were all going on and happening in the midst of the pandemic. And I think we've seen how prep has been scaled up. And we also think PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis. So um, in addition to ARVs and triple therapy for treatment, we've also seen the introduction of daily combination uh, pills of tenofovir and emtricitabine and how uh, that's been scaled up in most parts of the world. And we can see this really impressive uh, coverage rates uh, in San Francisco amongst men who have sex with men and how over the past three years, we've seen substantial reductions in new HIV infections. In Africa, for example, we've seen high uptake of PrEP, particularly in discordant relationships um, where the partner has been, the index partner has been recently initiated on treatment. Uh, but with the other populations, we've seen high rates of discontinuation and uh, just flagging the need for, um, uh, for, for uh, formulations that shift uh, uh, and, and provide additional options beyond uh, daily tablets. And uh, here we can see again, um, despite the pandemic, how ongoing research has resulted in the uh trials being completed, and we now have the two monthly injectable um, access uh, remains a challenge, uh, and, um, and, and we've seen also how uh, industry has been dominating some of the new developments in terms of long-acting slow-release products uh, and a whole pipeline of trials that are currently underway, including six-monthly injections of a capsid inhibitor called Lencapover. Uh, in addition to the small molecules, we also have a number of trials that are evaluating uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, for the HIV uh, prevention potential. But um, we uh, cannot ignore the impact of COVID uh, on, uh, um, uh, on our responses uh, to HIV. That was in a pretty good uh, trajectory. And I think working in, um, in, in countries in sub-Saharan Africa where these disease burdens, as I mentioned earlier, were very high, 
we really try to use uh, publications and uh, evidence and data to draw attention to the fact uh, that some of the interventions that we're being put into place, we're having negative impacts on our responses to HIV, including reduction in HIV testing and in ART initiations. And fortunately, uh, some of the innovations in terms of ARP treatment delivery, such as multi-month dispensing and more community-based um, dispensing or delivery at community venues uh, didn't have a huge impact uh, initially on um, those who were already on antiretroviral treatment. Um, but in the midst of all of this, um, many of us had ongoing HIV and TB uh, research underway with investigational new drugs. And one of the things that um, happened was that very early on, regulatory authorities were uh, preparing for the COVID response and um, uh, prioritized um, the COVID protocols that were coming in, either for med med medicines review or for uh, ethics review, and uh, issued um, a directive about stopping all other research. And so some of us got together and uh, contacted these bodies and uh, alerted them to these ongoing studies. And um, in return, they asked us for COVID-19 risk mitigation plans. And so we developed these plans and, um, and, and, um, and I'm gonna come back to the slide in a second, but uh, some of the preparatory activities started very late in January, 2020, even before the first cases. Uh, we identified in South Africa. In fact, some of the first cases were only described in March 2020. And um, even before then, what we started doing was sharing information through regular staff updates. We were providing information as it was emerging in two participants and also to the communities that we've been working with uh, in terms of our HIV research for nearly two decades. As soon as the gene sequences became publicly available, our lab staff uh, developed a PCR diagnostic assay, and um, we also segregated the lab into sections that were doing the HIV TB research from the COVID-19 in the earlier days when we knew very little. We initiated a staff surveillance program, which included daily symptom screen and weekly PCR testing, and if positive, we extended access to testing to other family members. This was very important during the first half of 2020 in South Africa, where there was very limited access to some of these testing uh, options and facilities. Um, we also reorganized ourselves both in the clinic and in the lab in terms of multiple teams so that we could ensure continuity in the event of infection and isolation because all of us were as vulnerable as the public uh, in terms of uh, um, getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. And um, we extended some of the screening to participants um, where we did pre-visit symptom screen on clinic arrival. And then if um, there were any indications of a, a potential uh, SARS infect, COVID-2 infection to do PCR testing, we scheduled visits by appointment and we provided transport to, uh, to our participants. So we minimized um, use of public transportation. And I think uh, some of what I have here uh, may be familiar to those on the call because I think we were all doing this uh, best described as building the ship as it sails. So we knew a lot about HIV and TB, very little about uh, COVID-19, but um, using some of that knowledge, many of us were playing uh, a role in terms of scientific advisory, advisors to the government and also uh, undertaking studies, uh, particularly uh, surveillance uh, studies, natural history studies, to try and understand this um, epidemic as it was coming in and being established. And then there was a major outbreak uh, in a hospital. Uh, one of the hospitals in KwaZulu-Natal, where they had 70% of the ventilators for the entire province. And uh, the response in March 2020 was to shut the hospital down 
And we said that's not going to uh, work, given that they have the majority of the ventilators in the province. And we were asked to come in and do an outbreak investigation. And that outbreak investigation tapped into some of the molecular surveillance systems that we'd established for HIV. And I'm going to come back and elaborate on that point and how that was really important. And then uh, looking at uh, also um, uh, opportunities to understand the interaction between SARS-CoV-2 and HIV and TB. And then um, as we moved along in the next several months, uh, how we utilize the existing research infrastructure to undertake COVID-19 vaccine trials. Now, before I go into some of our experiences, let's say we thought we had a grand plan, but there were many challenges and opportunities. And one of the first challenges that we had was the global competition for PPE, for reagents, for diagnostic test kits. And as the number of cases increased, the demand for testing increased. And so um, some of the surveillance activities that we put into place had to be um, uh, uh, had to be stopped uh, as hospitalized patients were prioritized for testing. But um, uh, part of setting this infrastructure created an opportunity for us to be a reference lab for evaluating rapid antibody and antigen tests. So that expanded and helped us cope with some of these diagnostic testing shortages. But it was also an opportunity to understand, as I mentioned earlier, interactions between HIV and COVID-19. And uh, one of the challenges, in addition to participating in trials and contributing to, in that first year, uh, several of the trials that produced the evidence of vaccines that were efficacious, was the old battle that we faced uh, in the early days of uh, HIV, or not so early days, uh, less than two decades ago, in terms of post-trial access to vaccines and also um, uh, our role in terms of contributing to vaccine implementation, particularly for healthcare workers. So now I'm going to um, elaborate a little bit more on what informed um, some of the decisions we made and how we moved forward uh, based on some of our experiences working and lessons from responding to HIV and these include community partnerships and trust and the importance of those, um, particularly how to communicate with the public when there's so much of anxiety and fear and mixed information coming through. Um, the importance of uh, creating um, a toolkit and building and expanding that, the importance of data for priority setting, and then um, the issues of uh, leaving no one behind. So just to start with the first on with HIV, I think um, right from the outset, um, and we've been reminded multiple times uh, and have integrated so much of our work in very close partnership with uh, communities. Uh, we saw the importance of actors, activism to advance the science and how when the science and the activism are closely intertwined, our ability to make progress is huge. And also in terms of uh, new evidence that we get, uh, moving that from proof of concept to implementation science is certainly enhanced um, when we do things with people as opposed to on people. And that was a very, um, that was a big piece even as uh, we were as scientists um, dealing with the uncertainty of the uh, unfolding pandemic, uh, whatever knowledge we had, and as our knowledge increased, um, we tapped into our community advisory boards. We did our door-to-door -door visits uh, to share the information with people. And then around the end of March, April, uh, we had really a superb leadership from the president and the Minister of Health at that time, and where they started to have regular meetings um, on TV uh, with the public. And um, several scientists in South Africa became trusted voices um, uh, that built on the trust uh, from their public communication on HIV now being transitioned to also talking about uh, COVID. Um, now in HIV, 
um, I spoke about the 2016 high level political uh, meeting and the declaration of ending AIDS as a public health threat. And that emerged uh, because of the confluence of knowledge we had uh, that enabled us to think about uh, with all the tools that we had um, to, uh, to, to even consider that we could set a goal like ending AIDS uh, as a public health threat by 2030. Uh, similarly, we created a toolbox for gathering whatever we had um, at the time uh, in terms of responding to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, another thing that was transformative in HIV was when we moved to rapid point of care diagnostics and, um, and, and how we shifted from waiting uh, two weeks for an HIV test result to being able to do a test uh, within minutes and even transition to home care. And, and so a lot of what we started to do in the diagnostics was also to contribute to shifting us from lab-based PCR to rapid point of care testing. And, um, and then in terms of the use of data uh, that enabled us to have a very granular understanding of where infections were occurring uh, and, and how to target and prioritize the so-called hotspots um, as we continued to measure uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infections. We took a very similar approach uh, in terms of identifying where um, uh, infections were concentrating and how to respond. And I wanted to turn now to the phylogenetics work and you're familiar with some of this work that we presented uh, at the International AIDS Conference in 2016, where we uh, sequenced um, uh, HIV uh, from uh, newly infected individuals and were able to demonstrate the cycle of transmission. And so when we had this huge outbreak at uh, this major hospital, St. Augustine's in KwaZulu Natal, the same team that had been working in understanding HIV transmission dynamics stepped up and uh, did the investigation at this hospital and established the um, uh, molecular uh, surveillance at that point. And that molecular surveillance turned out to be really key in terms of um, as we moved along and the pandemic uh, advanced and spread across the world, um, we were reminded that uh, the ancestral strain was just the beginning and how these variants of concern became uh, really critical and important. And we described uh, the beta variant, for example, and then in 2021, the Omicron and others, of course, have been describing it. And these variants of concern have uh, really altered the way we've seen surges of infection over the past three years. And you can see a sort of uh, uh, worsening, if you like, in terms of number of infections uh, with each variant of concern. And I think also what we've seen um, is as we were doing this molecular surveillance, we're able to, um, uh, as we were doing the vaccine trials, show what the impact of um, these uh, emerging uh, variants of concern were on the efficacy of different vaccines. And this helped us in South Africa to choose which vaccines we move forward with. And uh, you can see now with the Omicron, uh, we're also seeing how these uh, efficacy of the vaccines, uh, depending on what is circulating, is uh, impacted. But I think if we ever needed reminding about why we need to keep our eye on the ball and uh, keep focused on um, the variants of concern and not uh, drop our gaze on HIV and TB. It comes from this one. I mean, there are many examples, but this particular example we have of an HIV positive patient who had persistent um, SARS-CoV-2 infection over a seven month period. So she was experiencing um, viral th therapeutic failure and uh, was being initiated on a new drug regimen uh, but what we see in this diagram, without getting into all the details, is that already by day six that um, she had uh, started to develop uh, some very key and important mutations. And these mutations um, continued 
And you can see how um, uh, just in a single patient over this time period, the development of uh, three key mutations that um, contributed to the emergence and dominance of the beta variant. And then I think um, as we were doing the COVID work and looking at the impact of COVID on HIV TB, uh, we also had uh, the ongoing HIV work and particularly the in danger report uh, of leaving no one behind, uh, being flagged and, uh, and highlighted. And uh, together with UNAIDS, we undertook the survey looking at the multiple impacts of COVID-19 uh, particularly in women girls living with HIV and at high risk of, um, of infection in South Africa and undertook this national cross-sectional survey um, in the midst uh, of uh, all these uh, surges of SARS-CoV-2 infection taking place. And one of the um, uh, challenges we have in uh, our response to HIV is these uh, key and vulnerable populations that we're not uh, reaching with, uh, uh, with our standard approaches, uh, where we wait for people to come to healthcare facilities and, uh, and then do whatever we need to do. And I think that's enabled us to reach a whole lot of people. But this is now about this last mile and how do we reach people we're not reaching. And so we reached out to several community-based organizations across four provinces. We shared with them what the survey goal was and, um, and then um, requested um, interest in partnering in the conduct of the survey. We released the RFA and, um, and we had many several applications. And in the end, we went with three partners um, who are listed here. Uh, the AIDS Foundation, the African Alliance, and Youth Health Africa. And um, uh, we found a gap in terms of displaced populations or mobile populations and injecting drug users. And here we partnered uh, with, just in KwaZulu Natal with the Dennis Hurley Center and Right to Care. And on, on the um, right side of the screen, you see the breakdown of the population that we included. Uh, close to 3,000 people in the survey um, across the board and a range of things. And uh, I just wanted to highlight here some of the key findings um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the unintended consequences of some of the interventions as we responded uh, to the pandemic and how this impacted this particular group of uh, women uh, across the country, where we saw a 31% decrease in income, a 43% uh, increase in food security, um, uh, almost 40% reduction in access to HIV services, and uh, importantly, um, a 36% reduction in access to family planning or sexual reproductive health services. And what we found um, across each of these groups was that um, Vulnerability was uh, mediated through age, social status, wealth, and household resilience. Uh, sex workers and migrants were particularly vulnerable, but that um, there were very little differences in these outcomes, whether you were uh, at risk of getting infected or living with HIV. So just in terms of concluding remarks that um, we've seen in HIV and COVID-19, how science, how science has been transformed in various ways. And a lot of our investments in HIV um, uh, leapfrogged us into more rapid responses to COVID-19. With COVID-19, we've seen how open access uh, to data, uh, databases and um, open access to the published literature uh, enabled us to uh, move along a lot faster as a global uh, community. Uh, we've seen both with HIV and with COVID how scientific evidence were, was very important in decision making and providing guidance and challenging disinformation and myths. In the Q&A, we can return to that. I think this is the first time where we're having to deal with the pandemic with the social media platforms. And in addition to the spread of the viruses, we were also having to deal with 
very rapid spread of disinformation and myths. Um, uh, like uh, in AIDS, we had lots of politics as in HIV, we saw how triple therapy and access to antiretrovirals uh, enabled us to move away from uh, the political uh, debates and discussions uh, to actually getting products and, um, and intervention to those who would benefit most. With COVID, we've seen how the vaccines have provided hope and have moved us from fear and anxiety to thinking about returning to normality. Uh, but both with HIV and COVID, what we have uh, seen is a new lens for the nexus between science, politics, and global health. And I think uh, these are very important developments. And then just to end with this critical lesson, I think, from HIV that was so important, but um, uh, COVID hasn't quite picked up is the, our mutual inter interdependence and shared vulnerability. And uh, just quoting from the UNAIDS 2015 report, uh, where the AIDS movement demonstrates that with a shared vision, shared responsibility, and through global solidarity, we can change the course of history. And we did that. We did that with the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, with the US Presidential Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, and unprecedented acts of generosity and solidarity to ensure people in other parts of the world had access to life-saving medication. It was also about shared responsibilities where individuals see caring for fellow citizens as important to do better than those where individuals focus on themselves first. And um, I think that's, uh, I thought I should just end with that. Um, as we continue to live with SARS-CoV-2, with HIV, with TB, with Ebola, that um, we face many challenges and uh, we cannot afford to, when a new pandemic or epidemic emerges, to drop out the ball on other things. And I think we've made immense um, gains in HIV. Um, I have highlighted very quickly some of those. Um, but uh, just to say that uh, uh, I hope these uh, lessons that we learned, which I don't think is unique to South Africa, um, and sharing these uh, are an important point of departure for discussion on how we deal with multiple uh, challenges um, uh, on a daily basis and uh, move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koresha. This is. Uh... While I was listening to you, I felt like, wait a minute, we're dealing with a pandemic, but this is quite an optimistic story. And um, without HIV, COVID would have been a completely different story and you make it perfectly clear. Um, so thank you so much for inspiring us uh, that way. Um, for people who have been listening, this is the opportunity to ask questions. If you wanna, want to ask a question, please raise your hand or signal in another way that you want to do so uh, in the chat, for instance. Um, I will monitor those and I'm watching whether somebody is chiming in. That might take a minute. Gracia, let me start with, with the first opening question. You're talking a lot about we, we did this, we did that. And I felt like, wait, wait a minute, what was going on was so much this we must be uh, almost a town or a village <laughs> can, can you say a little bit more about who the we was and how that how that worked because so many so many people must have been involved in getting this done and sure. organizing this and that, that requires organization leadership uh, but also leadership that makes possible collaboration sure sure so first, uh, you know, a reminder, Theo, that's a great question. And, um, if, uh, you know, these days, what we do is very uh, rarely as an individual. Uh, we do it in collaboration, in partnership. Caprisa itself is a consortium of five institutions, which is the University of KwaZulu-Natal, 
the University of Cape Town, the University of Western Cape, University of Latvatistan, particularly through the National Institutes for Communicable Diseases, and then Columbia University. So that's the initial and foundational uh, consortium. Uh, we are the, our head. We are headquartered um, in the grounds of the Nelson R. Mandela School of Medicine. So we have close relationships with the medical school, the School of Public Health there, and uh, we also um, are in the Kerith Building. Uh, we on the uh, ground level. We have the CRISP um, team uh, led by Tulio de la Vera. And they do a lot of the phylogenetics work um, that uh, we partnered with them on for HI understanding HIV transmission dynamics. And so we have this ongoing partnership. And then above, as so Caprisa is on the second level, and one level above Caprisa is the African Health Research Institute. And at RE, for example, um, they are also looking at the interaction between uh, SARS-CoV-2 and HIV. And in a longitudinal study of, um, uh, of people experiencing treatment failure and responding to that, Alex Sigal, um, that patient that I showed with the multiple uh, mutations come from that clinical collaboration. And Alex, for example, very early on set up the BSL-3 lab to grow the virus and uh, so we were able to also understand um, in silico uh, what the impact was as new variants um, emerged mm -hmm. and as we started to get vaccines and so on. So this is say in Caprisa, we have 300 staff across four clinics mm -hmm. and um, we never stopped a day during the pandemic from working and coming to work. So unless you got infected, because we were as vulnerable as everybody else in the population, um, and you know we did those team things, and and right, we started preparation way before our first cases came in, and we said because we're doing um, trials that have investigational due drugs for HIV and TB, some of those were Caprisa initiated studies, some of those studies were with NIAID funded networks and some with other collaborators. Um, we couldn't just like, when, when the president announced a hard lockdown uh, and no movements for nearly five weeks, we couldn't say, no, we're gonna stop. So we applied for and got um, first re responder status and uh, with the mitigation wow. plans we put into place. So it is, I would say, many hundreds of people. So if you want to describe it as a village, I think it's more like a city on move where these different pieces were coming together. We had our community outreach teams in the communities going door to door, trying to understand and explain this new challenge. And then, you know, having the transport from uh, homes to the clinics and all of those things. So you're absolutely right that uh, we is the royal we, and um, we were connecting also to our colleagues at Columbia University through WAFA, through Max O'Donnell, and uh, our colleagues in Europe, what is going on there. And so we were all, you know, really when I said building the ship as it's sailing, I happened to be in Yokohama City a few weeks ago and got to meet um, the uh, the staff from the University of Yokohama who were providing care to the uh, cruise ship, the Diamond Princess uh, in the port. And it was just amazing how, you know, we were doing these virtual connections, uh, learning from each other and uh, trying to bring that and be better prepared. Yeah. But Kunisha, it also requires an amazing a, of a lot of coordination and amazing leadership um, to make this all happen. Yes. yes. Can you say a little bit about about how that worked? Yes. So somebody has to make the tough decisions, and I think it also, um, as much as I spoke about trust in the public and trust in the community, you, it doesn't happen overnight. And I think a lot of what we've done to date. Uh, between Slim and I, we have about 70 years of collective experience in responding to the HIV 
pandemic establishing uh, Caprice about 20 years ago, a lot of the staff that we have have been with us for over 10 years. Mm. And so I think when we um, be very open and transparent and, you know, we started uh, way before the, the pandemic challenges uh, to prepare and explain why we're doing what we're doing and, and how we're going to do what we have, a constant information flowing, having uh, calls with the staff once a week, uh, going through the issues, I think, um, uh, staff appreciated that uh, for sure because in their communities, you know, it became known. Uh, well, they were important sources of information, so the sort of diffusion and sharing information became important. We were doing like weekly um, newsletters and so on. So then, Slim and myself initially were part of the ministerial advisory committee together with 50 other infectious diseases scientists, the majority of whom were already working in HIV in some way or the other, uh, doing the sort of public talks, doing the uh, going on radio, going on TV. And I think it kind of helped to calm people and uh, and know from trusted voices, because sometimes politicians are trusted, sometimes they're not. <laughs> and so having this independent voice and, and just extending what we were already doing for HIV and TB, because every time we have new information there, whether we generated it or others, we already had systems for communicating that and for amplifying that information. So that was a very important. So leadership is important. Um, leadership that's trusted, leadership that uh, is able to make and take the tough decisions. Um, and you know, we very rapidly had to put things in place. Uh, outbreak investigation. Who's looking at where are the funds going to come from? And I have to say, like uh, that outbreak investigation in this uh, major hospital, which had seventy percent of our ventilators, we went looking at. Who was going to pay for what? I think we just scrambled, used the resources we had, and we're hoping like, okay, at some point we're going to make the books balance. But right now we got an emergency, we got a crisis. Let's deal with that and 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 try and put that by. So I kind of think about it also in retrospect that you know when you have a fire, firefighters mm -hmm. don't run from the fire. <laughs> So as epidemiologists, you know, in the face of epidemics and pandemics, you don't run away from it. That's the opportunity to actually respond. And if you run, who is going to do what? So part of it is just pragmatism. Part of it is saying this has to happen. We hear, we, we the informed individuals, let's just do what we need to do. Thank you. Good. There are a few questions and Claude would like to, let me see, ask a question and here she is, Claude. Hi, that happened a lot quicker than I thought. Hi, Croatia. It's so nice to see you. Um, wish we were all in person. Um, and sorry, I have a dog that all of a sudden started growling. Um, you know, this was a wonderful presentation, and I think um, it is no surprise to those of us who have followed you and Slim and Caprisa that you were at the forefront of this. Mm. So I kind of have two questions I get uh, uh, that I would like to ask. You know, one is um, you showed a slide earlier that had what the impact of, I think, lockdowns was or COVID policies. And we've seen the same thing here, right? Loss of income and a whole range of factors that the social determinants of health that have been an issue to begin with were majorly impacted. So as we think about the future and future pandemics, or if COVID shoots back up again with some other variant, how do we balance um, what we knew what was important in terms of, um, social distancing, isolating, lockdowns, et cetera, with what we know the impact was on those most vulnerable. Did that make sense when I'm asking, like, what are you all thinking? Um, that's one question. The second is South Africa clearly did way better than anybody predicted. In fact, 
in fact, many African countries did. Um, and just your thoughts a little bit about that um, compared to, say, the U.S. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Claude. Great to see you and great questions. So I think, you know, in terms of would we have done things differently? And I think in the first half of 2020, uh, none of us knew what to expect. And I think the devastation, in, in a way, there was, you know, some people, for example, say, well, we should have learned from SARS-CoV-1. We should have learned from MERS. But both of those were very contained epidemics. In fact, it lulled us into a false sense of security um, from a sort of public health point of view. And uh, SARS-CoV-2 just came and ran like wildfire. Mm -hmm. And all you were seeing, I mean, I remember the images of New York City and looking at Central Park mm. converted to a field hospital. And my immediate thought was, oh, we got to do better than that. <laughs> or, you know, when we look at um, where we were, the number of infections, and where the UK was, uh, you know, early time, we were like head to head. But um, because one of the things we did was intervened um, very uh, early on, uh, with the hard lockdown. And it wasn't about stopping the spread of the virus. That was like, no, we can't stop the virus, but can we put some pause to be better prepared? And it was then really about ventilation, we're thinking, and the hospitalization. We had no idea what proportion would be needing it, but we saw, you know, almost um, in all over Europe and North America, how health services were being overwhelmed. And so I think that was the right decision. And I know it's always debated mm. with hindsight, there's a lot of wisdom and so on. But I think what we knew at that point and what we did was the best that we could do at that point. I think we learned that this was more than a respiratory virus, that even initially it was more than just impacting older people. Um, that comorbidities were important. Um, we started to see how it affected the entire body uh, from head to toe. And, uh, you know, initially, I think uh, we knew very little about the pathogenesis. And uh, beyond the cytokine storm, uh, we didn't uh, think too much about long COVID. And I think that's the tsunami that we're waiting for now. And who knows whether we'll have pi, which is the uh, next potential variant of concern as Greek letters go. And, um, not a pizza pie or cherry pie, but uh, uh, you know, that's what, would, it, would we have it or not? And I think it's early days to say, oh, we're done with this. Although sometimes walking around in Manhattan, I wonder, well, did we ever have a bad anything here? And, you know, death rates are still really high. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we've all altered how we're dealing with risk and how we mitigate uh, risk. I do think the gender issues, particularly in the grey economy where many women work and particularly women with low income and hourly jobs and in the retail manufacturing sector and so on, um, have been very hard hit because some of the protections that many governments put into place were for formal workers. And a lot of the women don't fall in more, uh, uh, the more disadvantaged communities, um, Latin uh, ex or black communities, whether we're talking about the US or whether we're talking in other parts of the world, it's the same thing. Race and poverty go very uh, close together. And those were hardest hit. I think also the burden on women increased where, you know, you didn't have some of the support structure in terms of school closures and education of children and care for children. And then some of us had access to uh, uh, techni um, uh, technologies like this platforms and could continue and do what we mm -hmm. do the majority where those structural inequities and inequalities that underpin the challenges of the sustainable development goals exist. We see that within and between countries coming out very strongly. In fact, the 
reversal of some of the basic development gains is quite striking, particularly for infants and children without the childhood immunization, the schooling setbacks, and those that were most vulnerable went backwards like a decade or two. I think we're just getting a glimpse of that. Uh, so that has been uh, a serious concern and um, thinking about not just saving lives, but livelihoods uh, too, and, and how we define these circular economies. And, and then you have you know, all these displaced populations for any number of reasons, natural disasters, wars and conflicts. That was there already. Some of it got exacerbated during COVID. So we got a multiplicity of challenges on the one hand. On the other hand, we've seen how technology can leapfrog you, build resilience and do that. But again, it's those who have that are able to cope and those who don't um, are bearing the brunt of it. So if anything, for me, the take home is the SDG framework is really important. The role of uh, science, technology, innovation, is uh, becomes even more important. And if we, um, as a global community on one earth, uh, want to be reminded of our interconnectedness and shared responsibility, I think it's a real opportunity for us to very seriously take on gender inequity issues, all inequity and equality issues. Because until we can all realize our full potential, then I think we remain vulnerable. And, you know, those days, if anything, it's reinforced the sort of global oneness that we share, um, not the time to be parochial. And, you know, we do see that surfacing every now and again, um, sometimes more strongly than others. But, but this is the time, I think, where the technology provides an opportunity, innovation provides an opportunity to meet the needs, the very basic needs of safe water, food security, access to health, and access to quality education, addressing gender issues, ensuring our living spaces are healthier, and all of those things, it's, it's like a wake up call. And I think we should take that super seriously. Thanks, Gurisha. Um, you started answering uh, Heino's question, but maybe it's good to read it out. Uh, Heino Meyer Balberg asks, given the impact of both epidemics on Sintra Siotif, I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation use, especially in high risk women such as migrants, what is the impact on the incidence of high risk pregnancies and, the, and of the births of HIV uh, positive children? Yeah. <laughs> So that's a great question. In fact, it was something like, fortunately, some of us were quite uh, forceful about asking it uh, because our work was centrally around sexual reproductive health. And, you know, as we had trials going on and people living with HIV and with TB, um, we also had women who were pregnant at the time and so what does that mean when you stop services? And I should add that I think there was the one which was the stopping of services without quite thinking through all the ramifications and, and implications. And I think when we highlighted both with data, uh, the magnitude of the problem and where, what we needed to do, um, we had uh, listening years who intervened early enough, but it was this, um, flip side, which is, um, you know, in that first um, two months, especially around, um, I would say, more like three months, March, April, May, um, where we were just all <laughs> swimming in the dark, so to speak. Um, people didn't want to go to health facilities because they thought mm -hmm. if they went to a health facility, they were going to get SARS-CoV-2 and they don't want to get COVID. So it was like a little bit one of the, you know, uh, institutions um, closing doors uh, to cope with the new and, mm. uh, and, and severe burden coming in of the care and needs uh, with some basic things like women who were pregnant and having complications and so on. So I think the early interventions did some mitigation. But I think it wasn't 100% because 
uh, of this fear that individuals mm. had about seeking care. And that, that seems like a very reasonable thing. And so some of the complications that we saw was from people not um, utilizing services. I remember one of my mentees who's now head of the pathology services in the provinces calling me quite distraught about, you know, people were dropping family members off at the hospital and the next, and they couldn't see them, they couldn't talk to them. And then the next thing they were being asked to come and collect the family member's body in a body bag. And uh, and then there was this um, request that they should do autopsies to figure out cause of death. And uh, so he then had to bring the lawyers in and the children, the human rights lawyers. And for, mo for the most part, I think that because we have this very active um, advisory committee, we were able to bring um, some of the good evidence, and even if it wasn't strong evidence, but at least some of the common sense and logic to making better decisions. And I wouldn't say we won that battle 100%, but um, it, it was and continues to be a challenge. I think I felt for those mothers who, mm. you know, who, uh, who tested positive and then their babies were separated from them. And we know how important that first few hours are for bonding and so on, or whether father couldn't be there or the other partner and so this isolation at important events and milestones in families we completely disrupted the sort of caring that we normally express mm. and all of those that social disruptions we um i think you know one we're seeing it in the increase in mental health uh, challenges and issues but i think that like with the long COVID is something that we're starting to get a better sense of. And you're seeing it in choices people are making and the diversity of those choices that uh, we are in what I would describe like a post-traumatic stress point. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not over from the trauma just yet. It's still there. And that links nicely to the next question uh, from Gina Binkut. Uh, Gina, do you want to join hi caressa great to see you and caressa thank you for your decades long leadership in this area your, your scientific leadership and just your leadership as a as a um just an amazing sort of female spearheading this work mm -hmm. on women and girls it's just so impressive thank you so much I wanted to ask you um, a little bit about work on long haul COVID and if you see any differential impact on women and girls, but also just in general, the impact um, of long haul COVID on like adherence to HIV treatment regimens and things like that. Thank you again. Mm. Thank you, Gina, and so lovely to see you. It feels like a long time since our <laughs> paths crossed. Uh, always wonderful. And yeah, so again, you know, with our natural history studies and, and the, the, one of the things that happened was we set up these, um, uh, you know, uh, longitudinal studies uh, where staff enrolling to, so it was a bit of a, you know, turning around of uh, roles, uh, you know, we kind of enroll people in our studies as participants, but we don't often think about ourselves as participants. Mm -hmm. And with uh, some of our COVID studies, uh, that, that turnaround, and it, it allowed space. I think what we did was a few things, and a lot of our learnings came from setting this up for staff. And of course, it was optional. <laughs> it was optional whether you, you know, brought your family for testing, it was optional whether you wanted to enroll in any of these longitudinal studies. And because we, uh, like a 94% women-led and run organization, we did get some great insights about um, uh, the impact on uh, women and, and how we needed to extend some of our adaptations for working women, um, and, and particularly young working women, because we have the whole uh, range. Uh, I, I'm a bit of a minority in the over 60 group, but... <laughs> Um, uh, this uh, we got to get a better sense of the diversity of presentations of 
uh, long COVID. And um, in fact, as we did the vaccination, we also, of course, you know, well trained by Zena Stein, <laughs> in the disaggregated analysis and asking very actively the impact of vaccines and the impact of COVID and looking at that. So in terms of HIV infected individuals, um, and uninfected individuals, we, if they are on ARP treatment and virally suppressed, we were not seeing outcomes that were different from those uh, who didn't have HIV. But if you were HIV infected and you were not on ARVs and not virally suppressed, then we saw um, similar patterns to those who were immunosuppressed for other reasons, for example, being on um, uh, cancer therapy or something like that. So, uh, so age doesn't seem to lead to more aggressive. It was how is the HIV managed? And that's why I was saying if ever we needed motivation to get our HIV programs up and running and getting everyone why it was infected on treatment and virally suppressed and realizing that U equals U goal, I think, um, you know, these uh, data kind of supported that. What we, you know, we have about eight times more women on ARP treatment than men. And this missing men in our HIV response, you know, ha keeps coming back and there've been many efforts to try and address that. And so if we see gender differences, it's skewed because we have fewer men on treatment than women, not because mm -hmm. there are actual gender differences. Um, so that's um, an important uh, consideration. Uh, but right now, we're very focused on trying to really um, get the profile of the range of phenotypic presentations. Um, and and get to understand that better so that the interventions that we put into place can be more responsive. So it's like HIV, no one size fits all. The SARS-CoV-2 infection at an individual level has been very different and also unmasked underlying conditions. Like, for example, you know, we had um, quite a few staff with pre-metabolic syndrome and it kind of you know, push them over to um, to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And then we had other immunosuppressive, like, um, you know, systemic uh, lupus erythromatosis or other immuno, uh, immunological um, conditions that was actually masked and wouldn't show up uh, likely for the next 10 to 20 years. With COVID, suddenly we started to see those things. So, I think there were more some differences with vaccination in terms of vascular disorders in men. In, now I'm going to the general population. There were some ethnic issues. And, you know, in South Africa, as you know from Durban, there's like a nice melting pot of different cultures. So we're seeing like with different variants, how it impacted different race groups differently. And so, for example, with the beta variant, it had a much heavier impact on the Indian community oh. and the, the ancestral. So, you know, these are all, as I said, uh, you know, it just opened our eyes to say we can't deal with just one thing. We yes. have to deal with everything and then look at it as an opportunity um, and, and, and try and just uh, get as much data as possible. So this combination of staff included in studies and then the public and the community it has helped us get a better grasp of um, the breadth uh, and the sort of uh, diversity of these challenges. Thank you once again. Thank you for all your leadership. Thank you. Phil Kroneski would like to ask a question, Croatia. Phil, go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Phil Kroneski wants to ask a question. Phil, go ahead. Thanks, Teo. Uh, just <laughs> loading. Uh, fantastic, as always, Croatia. So good to see you um, and hear you uh, speak on these issues. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, more. I know you talked a, uh, some about it, but talk more specifically. I, you know, your focus, uh, your focus on um, youth 
and um, thinking about uh, my dog always thinks that I'm saying hello to people at the door. So it's very convenient. Anyway, um, so yeah, thinking about how COVID, you know, obviously affects different age groups differently, but specifically mental health and, and achievement of milestones. And we're working with Claude's team and, and cohort in New York and seeing, you know, some youth actually doing better, uh, some about the same. And then there's a group that are uh, really struggling. And we talked with providers about this recently and some of the issues you've already brought up, but like some silver lining being telehealth increase and then, but also the digital divide. And, and it's not like, we think, you know, the stereotype that young people will yes. just manage it, but they don't always. And so thinking about access to mental health and also the group that maybe struggled in terms of accessing HIV care, uh, who are young people and, and, and then these milestones. Yeah. And so kind of this complicated interplay. Well, good to see you and great question. I don't think I have all the answers for that, but I can just add a few comments. So firstly, you know, I think I half answered Claude's question, but there's the issue of the demographic profile in Africa being very different. So in a lot of the late uh, 90s and the 2000s, um, we had um, the parents being lost to AIDS and the life expectancy dropped to about 40, 42 years. And um, with the introduction of ARVs only in the mid 20s, like uh, in the mid, mid 2000s, uh, most of our communities, you still see 65% of the population is under the age of 35 years. And uh, for example, in several of the communities, I work less than 4% are over the age of 60. So you have that first, uh, so firstly, HIV uh, hit communities that were the poorest of the poor and most vulnerable. Then you have the social incohesion that was already there from the migrant labor system, uh, exacerbated with the deaths, and you had almost like a whole generation being wiped out, and you had a skip generation, as we described it, where grandparents and grandmothers in particular were looking after children. In some settings, you have child-headed households and so on. So there was a lot, there's a lot of those underlying issues. Um, and then uh, and then with COVID, we also saw a lot of uh, kids losing parents. And um, you know, with AIDS, you saw, you know, you had the closure of a funeral and the grief period and support of community and all the things that go with grieving. Um, it, with COVID, they, that wasn't there. So there was the social isolation, the isolation in the midst of grief, the challenges of food security and income and so on. And so you see that playing out much more. And I think that, uh, I'm not the psychologist, they lots on the call, <laughs> but we know this adolescence period and transitioning to adulthood, and whether you're in high school, or whether you're in a tertiary institution, university, et cetera, that's such an important part of cognitive development that was disrupted and not disrupted. You know, like I always think about that eight years of a child's life between 15 to about 24, every year is so important. In fact, every day and every few months is so important because it's such a fluid and dynamic period and not having sufficient support. So, um, so I think it's been a bit mixed in terms of one, identifying the problem, two, how we deal with it, I think, the suicidal ideation, just you know, from my um, interactions with medical students, for example, you know, they've had to do three years of medicine uh, virtually, <laughs> and uh, and these are three important years in a seven-year degree. And then I think about other faculties and how that also, so you know, you're kind of in a strange city. There's so many disruptions on your life. This is added uh, onto it. And then if you lost a family member or you were not there, for example, grandparents being lost and you couldn't be there because you couldn't travel, 
you don't have the sort of closure issues. So there's so many different things coming together um, that I don't think we uh, quite one grasp that confluence of challenges. And somewhere again, I think it's, um, it's not like a one size fits all. I think we need to understand and um, sort of disaggregate. And I think um, some in some settings where the sort of online um, telehealth, uh, telecounseling uh, was already in place with HIV, there was much easier transitioning uh, for coping with other issues. And those kids who were already getting some kind of support were already alert and sensitized and would seek care. And I think in many places, there's still a lot of stigma uh, associated with mental health issues. And so it's still under wraps and we, we're we not seeing it. And so part of the suppression of what it is. And I think when you look out and you see, you know, everyone else seems to have it together and you're not, you kind of uh, feel like it must be you. And I think that's where we found establishing group support systems. and. I mean, I was shocked and we, uh, both Slim and I were just appalled when we had the first few cases of COVID among staff, how other staff were uh, treating mm. that, those staff members. And, you know, we had to intervene very quickly and very strongly um, to deal with that. But you could see, you know, that fear about disclosing HIV status with COVID, you saw that coming through all over again. So. Imagine if you have multiple things going on that are stigmatized and you're isolated and so on. So, you know, it's not a homogenous community uh, film. Uh, it's a very important time in terms of transitioning. And I think it's an important group. And I've seen, um, you know, some more recent work from uh, larger studies uh, where we're now looking at biomarkers and can some of these biomarkers uh, help us to predict um, better and more quickly uh, who needs more intense interventions. But I think we all need to be a bit more mindful um, about people around us, in our communities, in our workplace, and, you know, um, have a handout to help them. Thanks, Carisha. Yeah, looking forward to hearing more. But that was uh, excellent. Thank you. It's just Susie Hoffman has a question. Susie, are you Susie, you want to ask yourself? You're welcome to join. And if she's not joining, Kresha, I will read her, her question. She as Susie Hoffman asks, the notion of solidarity has not been present in the US in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you think there was a difference in South Africa? Yeah, so initially, you know, we had a lot of the HIV activism that we saw in the US um, expanded across the globe and we saw how that activism helped us get treatment access. And then when COVID came along, quite a few of my friends who were HIV activists said, oh, how come we're not involved? And I said, well, <laughs> since when do you wait for an invitation to the table? <laughs> <laughs> In HIV, did you wait for an invitation? <laughs> and, and it kind of like triggered a little bit of that. And so um, just, you know, again, sometimes, uh, when something new comes along, you like we forget some of the history <laughs> that got us to where we are in a particular space. So it um, it was something that uh, you know with politicians, I kind of like let me take it from a political lens. So you got the scientists giving you evidence, then you got faith based organizations, then you got other civic structures and so on. And I think that um, with COVID, they uh, I think the activism was a little slower. In fact, I don't think we at any point reached it. But I also think that in HIV, some of our activism that uh, got us the success that we have has also slowed. And it's most like everyone's bought into this 
uh, be over with HIV, but we're not. And uh, so I think, the, the Susie, there's another issue around how you think of yourself. So do you think of yourself as me and uh, everything is about me? Or do you think about yourself as me, as part of a bigger community? And I think some of that um, is captured in the phrase of Ubuntu mm. in Africa is I am because of others. And I, I think uh, more often than not, it's the point of departure that I am because of others. And so when um, you ask to do something uh, and you know you may benefit or you may not benefit, but people around you could benefit, there's much more rapid uptake and adoption of it. I've also seen it in Japan, for example, mm. one of the few places where even though mask wearing is not compulsory, the fact that you are living with the older people and there's lots of old people, mask wearing continues as a voluntary thing because of this feeling of belonging and uh, being part of something bigger. Uh, I think in the US, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think in some communities, you do have that sense of solidarity. But I think also solidarity has to, and there's, I think, other divisions. And I don't, I'm not the expert on American politics, but I do think there is that difference about me versus we, and how in the face of challenges, in this case, the pandemic, uh, resilience is, uh, is so much shaped by, um, uh, uh, by, by what we do for each other, as opposed to just thinking about ourselves. And it's great to exercise our First Amendment rights about uh, uh, bodily integrity and what have you. But the reality is that we are not people who are, live in islands. We live in communities with other people and how we respect and interact with others is so important in terms of shaping our actions. Thank you. Kureshi, when I was first confronted with the word Ubuntu and, and uh, learned about the meaning, I felt like, as a psychologist, I felt like, well, but everybody is because of others. You cannot have an identity without other people around you. So um, I felt like, what is so special about it? And I think what is special about it is the awareness and the integration of that understanding in the community which in some parts of the United States is, is not as strong or maybe even lacking. Um, and, it, and it's wonderful to see that concept of Ubuntu working in, in, uh, in practice. Thank you. Um, I don't think there are any further questions. Kuresha, this was wonderful to hear and to really see how how you were able to do what you did in terms of um, the COVID response and uh, how that really was affected by everything that you've learned about HIV. And the optimistic tone in your presentation is really uh, uh, rewarding to hear and really inspiring. Um, Susie is online now. I'm not sure if she has a follow up question. If she has, she can go ahead. And I think there are connectivity issues. So mm -hmm. let's not wait for Susie. Um, Gina, thank you for your leadership. And of course, you know, I, I think that everybody here on the in the rounds feels the same. Um, the work that you have been doing in, in, in South Africa, but also beyond is so important and so inspiring to a lot of people. And um, a lot of thanks is in place for that. And Thank you for this presentation this morning. Really good to hear you, to see you, and I know you will be back. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Theo. And it's always wonderful to be part of the HIV Center Rounds and looking forward to seeing people in person in the near future and wishing you all well and stay well and take care. Bye. Thank you, Gracia. And to everybody in the rounds, we hope to see you back on May 4th. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.